Great. Well, th thanks very much to, to all of you for being here and to the organizers for the invitation. This is work that's joint uh, with Peter Crampton, who many of you know, and John Shim, who's a graduate student uh, at University of Chicago and in his former life spent uh, a number of years as a high frequency trader at, at Jump Trading. Uh, at a high level, I want to convince you that there's a simple structural flaw in the design of modern financial markets, and, and that flaw is continuous time trading. Uh, I'll start with an anecdote. Uh, Mao already mentioned the, the well-known and well-documented arms race for speed amongst high-frequency trading firms. This is maybe the best anecdote uh, from that race. In 2010, a firm called Spread Networks invested 300 million bucks to dig a high-speed fiber optic cable connecting markets in New York to markets in Chicago. The salient feature of the cable was that it was dug in a relatively uh, straight line, and this straight line increased uh, speed. It, it reduced data transmission time between these two markets uh, from 16 milliseconds uh, to 13 milliseconds. And three milliseconds doesn't sound like much. Blinking your eye takes about 100 times as long. Uh, industry observers remarked at the time, though, that three milliseconds is an eternity. The joke was actually that someone would dig a tunnel, so go through the Earth rather than around the Earth to get an even straighter line. Uh, this joke materialized, uh, not literally a tunnel, but microwaves are a different way to get a straighter line from New York to Chicago because light travels faster through air than glass. Uh, as of last week, the latency for the uh, best known microwave technology providers will just a shade over 8, point, uh, eight milliseconds uh, round trip. And there are analogous races for speed occurring throughout the financial system, some involving communications infrastructure between exchanges, hardware, software, physical capital, human capital. And we're we're going to look at this race for speed from the perspective of market design. And what I mean by this is that we assume that participants in the market act rationally in their self-interest with respect to market rules, but we want to take seriously the possibility uh, that the rules themselves are flawed. And our main point is going to be that the race is, a, is actually a symptom of a simple flaw in market design, and that flaw is continuous time trading, or, or mathematically continuous time serial process trading. And what we're going to propose as an alternative is discrete time trading, or, or really discrete time batch process trading, uh, auctions conducted extremely frequently but in discrete time to fix ideas, uh, say, every tenth of a second. So it's a long paper, and in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to get right into the analysis. Uh, the, the first part of our analysis is empirical, and what I want you to take from this is a set of stylized facts about how continuous limit order book markets behave at high frequency uh, time horizons. I'll, I'll assume knowledge of the limit order book design uh, for this audience, and Mao also uh, touched on it a bit. Uh, what I'll mention briefly is our data, our, our data is direct feed data that comes from exchanges, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. Direct feed is roughly the play-by-play -play of the limit order book with millisecond level uh, t precision, on, uh, timestamp precision. And these are the data that HFT firms subscribe to and parse in real time. We parse it retrospectively. Uh, and we're going to focus primarily on a pair of securities that track the S&P 500 index, a futures contract that trades in Chicago and an ETF that trades in New York. And we've got data covering seven years, 2005 to 2011. Um, this is a, a day of our data uh, for these two securities that track the S&P 500 index, just showing bid-ask midpoints over the course of a trading day. And the salient feature is that the two securities are extremely highly correlated, as you'd expect, given that they both track the S&P 500 in index, and so have an arbitrage relationship between the two of them. Uh, this is an hour of data, a minute of data, and then this is what the market starts to look like when you zoom into high frequency. This is a 250 millisecond slice of the trading day. And what you see is pricing relationships that look like they're behaving as we would expect, given asset pricing principles, actually act in a much choppier fashion. Uh, which ex post is, is kind of obvious. There's nothing in financial market design that would enable two securities prices to move at exactly the same time if we run markets in continuous time using separate auctions. Uh, th there's two ways to quantify this phenomenon. Uh, one is in terms of the correlation between these two assets at different time horizons. So uh, at a day or even a minute or a few seconds, the correlation is, is basically one. It's in excess of 0.99. At a millisecond, the correlation is basically zero. It's lower than 0.01. And it doesn't matter how you adjust for relativity, whether you take the perspective of a Chicago trader or the perspective of a New York trader uh, or ignore it. 
Um, the second way to quantify this phenomenon is in terms of the arbitrage opportunities it creates. So for instance, right here, the arbitrage opportunity is buy cheap in New York and sell expensive uh, in Chicago, and this is a, a rent that creates a race for speed to capture the arbitrage opportunity. And what I'm going to show you is actually the time series of these ARBs over the course of our, of our seven years of data. So the first fact is that the duration of arbitrage opportunities comes way down over time. So in 2005, the median arbitrage opportunity lasted about 100 milliseconds. By 2011, the median arbitrage opportunity lasted less than 10 milliseconds. And this shows the distribution uh, of, of arbitrage durations by year, and you can see the distribution collapsing from 2005, 6, 7 to 11 uh, towards faster and faster uh, correction of mispricing, faster and faster arbitrage opportunities. Uh, this is the profitability per unit traded uh, of the arbitrage opportunity. And where duration comes way down, uh, profits are actually pretty flat. You can see this both in the median uh, and in the distribution. You can see a, a slight uptick during the financial crisis when markets were especially volatile, and that's something we'll explain with our theory, but, but the, the salient fact is that durations came way down, profits per unit traded are pretty flat. Uh, the frequency of arbitrage opportunities does vary a lot over time, but its variation is explained almost perfectly by just asking how volatile uh, was the market on a given day. So arbitrage profits then uh, track volatility closely. This is a, a complementary view of the same phenomenon in terms of correlation patterns. So what this shows is on the horizontal axis is time intervals from a millisecond to 100 milliseconds. On the vertical axis is correlations uh, for each year of our data. So you can see over here at 100 milliseconds, uh, the correlation getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, and this is information getting from Chicago prices into New York prices faster and faster and faster each year. It's the analog of the ARB durations coming down over time. But you can see here that at high enough frequency, the correlation invariably breaks down. And this is kind of the analog of the fact that the profitability of these arbitrage opportunities doesn't get competed away. So our takeaway from, from the empirics is that the, the race looks something like a constant of the market design rather than an arbitrage opportunity that gets competed away over time. Right? Our, usual, our usual intuition as economists is that if there's an obvious arbitrage opportunity, it gets competed away. Here, the comp it doesn't get competed away in dollars, it just gets competed away uh, in speed. So in the correlation analysis, we see that uh, competition increases the speed with which information makes it from one market to the next, but doesn't uh, eliminate the, the root issue that correlations break down at high enough frequency. And in the arbitrage analysis, we see that competition increases how fast you have to be to capture ARBs, but does not actually reduce the size or frequency of arbitrage opportunities. A, a brief note on magnitudes, we, we compute that this one trade, uh, S&P 500 arbitrage, is worth about $75 million uh, gross per year. It does vary. The highest year in our data is 2008 during the financial crisis. The lowest is 2005 because it was a, a pretty calm year. Uh, but what I'd emphasize, emphasize is that ES SPY is just the tip of the iceberg in the race for speed. There's hundreds of trades extremely similar uh, to this one. In fragmented equity markets, there are trades even simpler because literally the same security trades on multiple venues and dark pools. Uh, there's the race to the top of the book, which, which Mao talked about very nicely in his paper uh, earlier, and there's the race to respond to, to public news events. And if you've been following the high-frequency trading debate, uh, you can think of the Michael Lewis book as really focused on this issue. Uh, the New York Attorney General's interest in, uh, in high-frequency trading originally uh, traced to, to this issue. And, and we don't try to put a dollar figure on the total sums at stake at the, in the race. We don't really have enough data to do that responsibly but common sense suggests there's a lot of money on the line. So I, I now want to get to the theory model, and this is in some sense the heart of the paper. If you understand uh, the theoretical critique of continuous limit order books, you'll understand why moving to discrete time batching uh, directly solves, solves the problem. And this is a, it's a simple model that both critiques the, the limit order book and identifies the economics uh, of the arms race. So in this model, there's a security call at X that trades on a continuous limit order book mar uh, market. There's a publicly observable signal call at Y of the value of this security X. And we're going to make a purposefully strong and, and simplifying assumption, which is X is worth Y. X is perfectly correlated to this public signal Y. And moreover, X can always be cautiously liquidated 
uh, at this fundamental value. So what we're trying to develop is a best case scenario for price discovery and liquidity provision on a continuous limit order book market. There's no asymmetric information, uh, no inventory costs, and so forth. Uh, for those of you who know the microstructure literature, you can think of our model as a descendant of a Gloucester Milgram style model. It's simpler in most ways. The, the one way in which our model is, is richer is that it takes the rules of the continuous limit order book uh, market design extremely seriously. Most of the mic microstructure theoretical treatments of limit order books uh, use a discrete time sequential move modeling abstraction uh, of the limit order book, um, which eliminates the possibility of some of the, the, the phenomena we're going to capture in our model. Um, so this signal Y evolves as a compound Poisson jump process. Uh, there's an arrival rate lambda jump, and big J is the variable that describes the absolute value of jump sizes. That's what's relevant for the analysis. There's two kinds of players in our model, investors and trading firms. Investors represent end users of financial markets, a picture of mutual fund. Uh, there's no asymmetric information in our model, so we could call these uh, players liquidity traders or, or noise traders, and they're going to be extremely mechanical in our analysis. They arrive stochastically to the market at a Poisson arrival rate, lambda invest, and they need to either buy or sell a unit. The other players are trading firms, uh, equivalently high-frequency traders. Uh, they don't have intrinsic demand to, to buy or sell X, they just want to buy low uh, and sell high, and their objective is to maximize profits per unit time. Uh, initially, we're going to treat the number of trading firms as exogenous, and there's at least two, and below we're going to endogenize entry. Uh, initially, in the exogenous entry treatment, I'm going to assume away all sources of latency. There's no latency in observing innovations in this public signal Y. There's no latency in interacting uh, with the continuous limit order book. And again, we're trying to develop a best case scenario for performance of this market design. Uh, in the endogenous entry case, I'm going to add latency in observing the signal, so capturing the idea that traders in New York can invest in faster connections to Chicago or faster connections between the various market centers in New York. Um, okay, so given this model setup where there's no asymmetric information, uh, no inventory costs, and so forth, you might expect that competition among the many exogenously present trading firms would lead to zero prices for investors. And what does zero price mean here? It means a, a zero bid ask spread, effectively free uh, liquidity. But that's not what happens in this market design due to something we call sniping. So here, here's the idea. Suppose, suppose there's a jump in the public signal Y from Y lower bar to Y upper bar. And think of this as the moment at which the correlation between Y and X momentarily breaks down. So if I'm a trading firm in the market for X, providing liquidity in the market for X, providing bids and asks, and the world changes, there's a jump in the public signal, I'm going to send a message to cancel my old quotes and replace them with new quotes that reflect the new public information. Uh, at the exact same time, all of the other trading firms, so if we're all trading firms, all of you are going to try to buy from me at my old quotes uh, before I can cancel them. And since the, and this is kind of the key point, because the continuous limit order book processes message requests in serial, so one at a time uh, in order of receipt, it's possible that one of your messages to snipe my stale quote will reach the exchange before my message to cancel my stale quote. And in fact, not only possible, but probable, because there's one of me and there's n minus one of you. So with probability n minus one over n, in response to any big jump, liquidity providers get sniped. Um, so in a, in a continuous limit order book, what this shows is that even symmetrically observed public information creates arbitrage rents. And th this isn't supposed to happen. There aren't supposed to be obvious mechanical arbitrages in an efficient market. It's closely associated with the correlation breakdown phenomenon. And it's a descendant of glaston milgram adverse selection. But instead of being caused by information asymmetries between an informed trader and a market maker, it's caused by the, the market design itself. And the way to think about it is what we show is that symmetrically observed information in equilibrium in this market design gets processed as if it were asymmetrically observed because somebody has to get processed uh, first. So the only symmetric information in a continuous limit order book is information that's re uh, released after the market closed or before the market opened. In equilibrium, this cost of sniping is going to get passed on uh, to investors as reduced liquidity. 
Um, so we, we derive a unique static Nash equilibrium. This, the, specifically what I mean by uniqueness is, is in the formal statement in the paper. Uh, investors behave mechanically as I've described. And the trading firms, of the N of them, one, they're going to endogenously sort into two roles. Uh, one plays a role we call liquidity provider. The other N minus one play a role called stale quote sniper. The liquidity provider maintains a bid and an ask for unit X, symmetric about the public signal Y, just moving around with the public signal. If an investor comes and trades, they replenish. And then snipers lurk in the background. And if there's a big jump, they try to, uh, they try to snipe. And they're successful one out of N at a time. Um, equilibrium is going to be characterized by indifference between uh, these two roles. Um, and in practice, many HFTs are both engaged in both liquidity provision and steel quote sniping. Um, so the e equilibrium is characterized by indifference between the two roles. I'll, I'll skip the algebra and just get to the indifference condition, which has a nice economic inter interpretation. Uh, on the left-hand side is the revenue from investors due to the non-zero bid-ask spread, so just investor arrivals uh, times the bid-ask spread. And on the right side is an object that represents the total rents to trading firms uh, from the arbitrage opportunities that are built in uh, to the market design. Um, a, a parenthetical is what happens if investors need to trade many units. If some investors want to trade one unit, like in our model, but some want to trade large blocks. Well, if a liquidity provider provides a deep book uh, and the world changes, they're going to get sniped for the whole amount. So the costs of providing depth scale linearly with the amount of depth liquidity providers provide. But the benefits don't scale, so some investors only want to trade small amounts. So, so in this model with symmetric information, not only is there a positive bid-esque spread, but markets are, uh, markets are thin. Uh, we then endogenize entry in a, in a very simple way. Um, we say that all players in the game can, can observe innovations in Y for free using a slow technology with latency delta slow. Or you can invest. You can pay a cost C speed to observe innovations at a faster latency, delta fast. So think of this as investing in the spread networks cable, or now it'll be investing in cutting edge microwave technology, software, et cetera. Uh, and we get an equilibrium that's got a, it, it, the same structure as above, endogenous sorting into one liquidity provider and minus one steel quote snipers. Ends now endogenous and is going to be governed uh, by a free entry zero profit condition. Um, and roughly what happens is the continuous limit order book creates a pile of rents, and then speed competition dissipates uh, the rents. And you, you could generalize the model to give inframarginal trading firms, th those who have a comparative advantage at speed, uh, uh, rents. Um, I'm going to skip, uh, skip the algebra in the interest of time and just show you the equation that kind of summarizes the equilibrium. On the left-hand side is the revenue from investors due to the non-zero bid-ask spread. On the right-hand side is the total expenditure by trading firms in speed. So there's an equivalence in our model between the prize in the arms race, expenditures on speed, and the, and the cost, uh, cost to end investors. Uh, a few quick remarks on the equilibrium. So, so one is just what, what exactly is the market failure here? And I think of it as a combination of two market failures. The, the market design creates a pile of rents. Symmetrically observed public information earns rents in this market design. And then these rents induce a, a race for speed, which mathematically is equivalent to a prisoner's dilemma. Um, second is the equilibrium ties into the empirical results in a nice way. The object, which I touched on briefly, that describes the prize in the arms race, uh, if you stare at it, you'll see that it does depend on parameters which have to do with market volatility, but does not depend on parameters that have anything to do with speed. It doesn't matter whether so the speed differences at play are seconds or hundreds of milliseconds or milliseconds or now hundreds or tens of microseconds. Um, so the, in, in this sense, the problem we have identified is an equilibrium feature of the market design, which I think ties in nicely uh, with the empirics. It doesn't get competed away as, as HFTs get faster and faster. OK, so the last part of the talk is I want to talk about frequent batch auctions as a market design response to the problems with continuous time serial process trading. So at a high level, I want you to think of frequent batch auctions as the continuous limit order book, but with just two changes. Uh, one is that time is treated as a discrete variable, not a continuous variable. And then two is discrete time raises the possibility that multiple things happen at, quote, the same time. That's not possible in a continuous time market. Um, 
and we're going to process things that happen together at the same time in a batch process using an auction as opposed to serially using a limit order book. Uh, a, bit more, uh, a bit more fully, uh, the trading day is divided into discrete time intervals of length tau. Uh, at any time during the day, tra uh, traders, investors, etc., can submit uh, orders, which are just price, quantity, direction, tuples, just like in the limit order book market. And they can modify or cancel these orders at any moment. Uh, if an order is in, in the auction at time t and doesn't get executed, it just, keeps, um, it just carries over to the auction at time t plus 1, t plus 2, and so forth. Uh, at the end of each discrete time interval, the exchange batches together all outstanding orders. This is outstanding orders from earlier periods, um, as well as new orders that were submitted uh, during this period, uh, and computes market level uh, supply and demand curves. There's, there's two cases. Supply and demand either don't cross or they do. If supply and demand don't cross, uh, then all outstanding orders just carry over to the next batch interval. And that's going to be, a, that would be a common case in practice. You know, most stocks have uh, no activity in most seconds, let alone most tenths of seconds or milliseconds. Um, if supply and demand do cross, uh, then the market clears at the uniform price where, where supply meets demand. Uh, two more details I want to mention. So first, what does priority mean uh, in, in this market design? And again, we're trying to take the continuous limit order book and keep it as, as similar as possible while making time discrete and batch processing. So priority is still price than time, but treating time as a discrete variable. So that means if my order has been resting in the book uh, for a long time and your order is new to the book this batch interval, I have priority over you. But if you and I enter the book during the same batch interval, uh, we have the same priority even if you beat me to the book uh, by a, a tiny amount of time. And I think this relates to Mao's, this is why this market design addresses uh, the race to the top of the book that Mao so nicely highlighted in, in his talk. Uh, the information policy is analogous to the continuous limit order book as well. Um, in the limit order book, you send a message to the exchange, it gets economically processed by the exchange and then displayed publicly. In frequent batch auctions, you send a message to the exchange, it gets economically processed by the exchange and then displayed publicly. The difference is that the economic processing happens in discrete time. Okay. Uh, so there's two reasons why, why going from continuous serial to discrete batch solves the, the issue with the continuous limit order book. So one is it reduces the relevance of tiny speed advantages. Uh, so the way to think about this is, is pretend I'm a slow trader and I'm trying to provide liquidity to investors and one of you is a fast trader. Um, in the continuous market, anytime there's a jump in Y, I'm vulnerable to being sniped by you. So I'll, I'll, uh, anytime anything happens, you get to react first. In the discrete market, for most jumps in Y, either you and I can both react or neither of us can react. There's only a tiny sliver of the batch interval uh, where your speed advantage is relevant. So if you look at this picture from zero, this figure from time zero to the end of the batch interval tau, anything that happens before tau minus delta slow, both you and I see in time to react. Anything that happens after tau, del tau minus delta fast, neither you or I see in time to react. So it's only a delta wide sliver that creates asymmetric information. So that, that's reason one. And then reason two is the auction, and this is more, the more subtle one, the auction changes the nature of competition to competition uh, on price. So, so as above, imagine I'm a slow guy providing liquidity, or I could be a fast guy providing liquidity and I happen to be a millionth of a second slower than you to respond to some, to some signal. And imagine there's a jump during the critical interval where, where you see it and I don't. Um, in the continuous market, there'll be a race to, a race to snipe me. In the batch market, if there's many who see the jump and I don't, so I'm a slow trading firm, there's a jump during, during um, this slice of the trading day seen by many fast trading firms. Uh, there'll be many of you who want to exploit my stale quote, but instead of competing to be first to accept my stale quote, you compete on price. Whoever is willing to offer me the best price gets the trade. And equilibrium price competition drives the price of X to its new uh, correct level. So a slow liquidity provider uh, gets a price determined by auction as opposed to a stale price. Another way to think about these two points is that discrete time dramatically reduces the likelihood that a tiny speed advantage creates asymmetric information. And then the auction, when information is symmetric, encourages price-based competition. The auction eliminates rents from symmetric information. And of course, with batch intervals as fast as we have in mind, there's still plenty of scope for, 
genuinely asymmetric information about security values in the world. What frequent batch auctions does is it eliminates inf rents from information that many trading firms observe at basically the same time and understand uh, essentially equally well. Okay, so the, the equilibrium of frequent batch auctions, we again study in the case of exogenous entry, uh, exogenous entry and then endogenized entry. With exogenous entry, uh, there's again n greater than two trading firms exogenously in the market, fix any strictly positive batch interval tau. And in equilibrium, Bertrand competition does what we might have expected it to do. It drives bid-esque spreads uh, to zero in depth towards effectively inf infinity, and there's no sniping. And what this equilibrium does is it highlights the central differences between discrete time batch auctions and continuous time serial process limit order books. Uh, there's no more rents from symmetrically observed public information. There's no more mechanical arbitrages or sniping. And competition on price drives the spread to zero, which we, which we would have expected. And, and in this equilibrium with exogenous entry, this obtains, mathematically at least, for any strictly positive tau. So it's kind of a discontinuity mathematically as you go from continuous time serial processing to discrete time uh, batch processing. We can discuss the practical interpretation of that uh, offline. Uh, the next equilibrium studies um, uh, the case of endogenous entry, and here what we obtain is that if tau is sufficiently long, if the batch interval is sufficiently long relative to the speed differences at play, then there's an equilibrium in which it's just not worth it to invest in speed. There's not enough of an asymmetric information advantage gleaned from uh, being faster to justify the expense. And so we get a condition where one of the key uh, parameters in this condition is the fraction of the time during which uh, my speed advantage over you is economically relevant. And that has to do with this ratio, delta my speed advantage to tau the, the batch interval. Um, that equation we can calibrate. It's extremely rough. Uh, and we do this in, in the appendix, not to give it too much emphasis uh, in the paper, but I think it gives a useful sense of magnitudes. We use a combination of our ES spy data and, and data from what limited public uh, SEC filings there are from high-frequency trading firms. Uh, a parameter that's difficult to interpret is delta. We think there are two natural interpretations. One is that delta is year-on-year -year speed improvements of the cutting edge. So cutting edge HFT this year versus cutting edge HFT last year. Um, for New York, Chicago trades, that delta would be about 100 microseconds if you contrasted 2014 to 2013. Another interpretation is that it's the difference between state-of-the-art HFT firms and sophisticated algorithmic trading firms that aren't at the cutting edge of speed. So not, not HFT versus grandma, but HFT versus sophisticated, counterpart, sophisticated counterparts. Uh, under the first interpretation, and again, extremely rough sense of magnitudes, we get a lower bound for tau on the order of uh, 10 milliseconds or a tenth of a second. And under the second uh, interpretation, we get a lower bound for tau on the order of 100 milliseconds uh, or a second. So again, extremely rough, but it gives a sense that the, a batch interval of a nanosecond isn't going to solve the problem, and it's not like we have in mind batch intervals of a minute or an hour or a day. Uh, there's a lot of open questions remaining about, about frequent batch auctions. Just in the interest of time, I won't, uh, I won't cover them and uh, I, won't, I won't talk about them in any detail. There's, you know, there's another Chicago question. If this is such a good idea, why isn't uh, somebody doing it already? And there's, I think, pretty good, uh, pretty good reason, uh, reasons why. There's issues to do with the fragmentation of U.S. equity markets. Uh, there's, the, there's issues to do with market stability. So a contention in the policy debate about high-frequency trading is that the, another cost of the arms race for speed is that it's destabilizing for financial markets. And this is something that's, that's very hard. No one's really pinned that point down theoretically. That's a, it, there's a, it's a bit loose, but we think um, discrete time trading does have important computational advantages over continuous time trading. Uh, at a high level, discrete time respects limitations of computers. Uh, and there's open questions, read the frequent batch auction design itself. Our model is extremely stripped down. So just to, just to summarize, we take a market design perspective to the HFT arms race. The root problem is not evil high frequency traders. The root problem is bad market design, uh, continuous time serial processing. And the alternative is discrete time batch process auctions. And just to recap the argument, we use direct feed data from exchanges to show that continuous time markets don't work the way we expect them to. Uh, correlations break down. There are frequent mechanical arbitrages which do not get computed away. 
Uh, the theory shows that the root cause of this issue is the continuous time limit order block market design. The arms race is a never-ending equilibrium feature of the design, harms liquidity, it is socially wasteful. And then we, the third part of the paper shows that discrete time batch processing solves uh, the problem. It eliminates sniping, uh, stops the arms race, enhances liquidity, maybe has computational advantages. Uh, there might be costs left outside of, of the model, which is an important caveat. Although I'd also ask that there, add that there have been costs of the continuous time market design that are left out of the model as well. Uh, so let me, let me stop there. Thanks very much.